I'll stand up if I have to. <laughs> I wouldn't, because I can't see you people over there if I sit down, can I? You prefer it not seeing me? Okay. But, uh, <laughs> thank you, Willie. I have stood in this room before. It seems a long time ago. Yeah, well, it's the same lecture. <laughs> so always, you always had to be a bit, a bit careful of that. And um, in your introduction, you reminded me you wanted me to talk about technology, which I'd completely forgotten about. But anyway, it doesn't matter. What I really want to say is that you get to a sort of... So a few years ago, I had a few troubles in the sort of 2007-ish, round about then. And I did announce to the world I'd given up architecture. And much to my disappointment, the world believed me. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually only the other day, as with um, the, the, the chief executive of the Royal Academy, and he said, are you working these days, Will? I thought, oh dear. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to assure you that I am working. I'm probably busier now than I've ever been. And there are only some things which have changed. One is, I don't really talk to the press anymore. So I'm post-press, depressed, if you like. <laughs> and it's much more relaxing. <laughs> and I, I think the state of architectural um, journalism, with one or two exceptions, my dear, um, is actually pathetic today. And I don't understand all sorts of things. Who's that man, Wainwright? What's his name? Oliver, Oliver Wainwright. Young man, knows nothing, and is highly opinionated, and thinks that all you people, you, and me, and them, should be doing really boring work. There's a bigger polemic behind it than that. And then, having just come from the RIBA, where they're about to announce the Sterling Prize tonight, if you look at that list, you think, ah, Oliver Wainwright must have picked that list. <laughs> <laughs> is, with perhaps one, one, possibly two exceptions, tedious. And you think, is that, if that's what I'm expected to do, maybe I should give up architecture. And I hope that none of you, well, some of you will be miserable and you won't enjoy the rest of your life. <laughs> but the majority of you <laughs> will um, go on and you want to explore things and try things out. And that's my advice to you. You've got to stick to your guns. Don't read Oliver Wainwright or any other people like that because you'll go down a dead end. And you know, it might be fashionable what he's saying, which is at the moment, which I suspect is, it is only fashionable. But all fashion goes out of fashion. So don't be distracted by these boring things, OK? I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also not so very keen on awards. So I'm also post-award. We don't go in for any anymore. Because there are thousands of them. I was very proud to win the Sterling Award in 2000, that, that was good, because there was money attached. <laughs> which is, and then even that, they, they did without money for a while. Uh, that's another story. But there are awards, for, you could go to an award ceremony at least once every week in, in the winter for something, you know. You could, some weeks, I'm sure two or three times, you know. And I can't understand it. The only funny award that I did win, which I really liked, was the Galvanized Steel Award. That was great. And the reason it was great, they were, A, they were very nice people, and B, my award was a really useful, rather beautiful watering can, <laughs> which I still use today. So I thought, that's great. It's better than one of those things. You, at least you can use it. You, it's not the thing that catches dust on the shelf. But you could have lots, and I suspect there are some architects, I know there are some architects there, they put all these things all online. You think, oh, God, you know, spend their time entering awards and winning them. <laughs> I know their work. Ooh, how do you manage to win? Anyway, that's <laughs> something else. Anyway, we're post-award, post-press. And I also, uh, one of the things that um, Willie didn't say in, in, in his introduction is I have been a, a professor of architecture in Vienna for quite a long time. In fact, this coming academic year, is, will be my last year, because I have to retire. Then I become Professor Emeritus. It always sounds like a disease to me. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'll do that. But I've enjoyed that since 1996. I like thousands of students, 4,000 students of architecture. 
in the Technical University in Vienna. Sounds scary. You spend your first year trying to say, please don't be an architect. And no one leaves. <laughs> but what I do like is they probably don't start studying until they're 21. So probably a bit later than is normally expected in, the, in this country. And they certainly don't qualify until they're 30, 31, 32. So 10 years is the average length of time it takes to qualify. And I used to be critical of that. But I've thought about that a lot. And actually, by the time they're 32, they're really good people. They've dipped in and out of education. They've worked a bit. They've traveled often a lot. And they sort of know some, a thing or two about the world. That's really good. And they know, perhaps most important of all, they have some idea of who they are. It's probably completely wrong, but at least they have an idea of who they are. <laughs> and and they're, they're quite well equipped to do all sorts of things. I'm not talking like some of you will end up as CAD, fo CAD fodder for Foster. You don't want to do that, do you? Foster's office is, is, is next door to mine. And I see them all, all 1,800 of them. So we opened a bar called the Doodle Bar because they need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and they come. So we make money out of Foster, <laughs> which is quite good. And um, so we like that. But, you know, they're all the same. And you say, you're working for Foster, aren't you? Yeah. Why? Well, it will look good on my CV. No, it will look very bad on your CV <laughs> if you do that. Because it, what it tells me is you wasted a couple of years that could have been used more intelligently. That's nothing against Norman. I quite like Norman. Yes, I do, actually. I just <laughs> think about that. <laughs> At least he invented something. He got something going. Where it is now is, is, is well, you can decide. But um, personally, I think it's, it's too big and too commercial. And there is inventiveness in it, but in patches. There's a lot of crap. So you have to be careful in your life going forward. But anyway, going back to my students in... Uh, in Vienna. This thing about spending, I've, I've come to the conclusion that a 24 year old, when you could get your part to in this country, you probably won't, but you could, is useless. They came straight from school, no gap year, straight into part one, then they do part two, maybe with a, with a uh, another, I mean, it's, it's just, they know nothing. You know, and they come, sometimes they come work. In, in our studio, and you think, these guys need a second course in architecture. And I always say to the students now, if you're in your 20s, your 20s is about doing all those things, learning, getting experience, traveling, falling in love, falling out of love, all of those things. Get it out of the way. <laughs> it's really good. And you don't have to worry about, you know, because with the pressure from your parents maybe, or or your lover or boyfriend or girlfriend, whatever it is, saying to you, isn't it about time you earn some money? Because you, A, you won't earn very much, so that's irrelevant. But a 24-year-old today <coughs> is not the same age as a 24-year-old 30 years ago. You are younger. You are more pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> more lovely. <laughs> no. no, that's good. I mean, it's good. I mean, that's fine. There's no hurry. I, I've come to the conclusion that you will all live at least 10 years longer than me. And if you don't smoke, maybe 15 years longer than me. <laughs> so you can add that 10 years of your 20s onto the end, can't you? <laughs> then you don't have to retire. That saves the government a lot of money in, reti in, in, or in pensions. So that's maybe a good thing or not, I don't know. Um, but it keeps you alive. And I think that's important. So there's no hurry. And I think that's important for some of the work that you actually do, your actual work, is don't be in too much of a hurry. Because you're, you're being entered into a world of Revit and BIM and all those things. And before long, you know, you can press a button and it will design it and then it will print out the building components. And you say, what did I do? I pressed the button. <laughs> it's not very interesting. You're more interesting than that. And therefore, and it takes time, and it takes confidence, and it takes passion and love. And if you haven't got that, then you shouldn't be studying here or indeed anywhere else. Oh, that's a bit hard. I'll soften that in a bit. But anyway, <laughs> nonetheless, there it is. 
I also concluded, as I've got older with all this teaching nonsense, is I actually don't have anything to teach you at all. I don't think my role as a teacher is not to teach, and it's much better because of that. My role is to encourage you to upset your teachers. <laughs> because then there's a real discussion and something to chat about. And it's much better, you know. So you don't... Uh, there used to be a man teaching here, Perforius, was he? What was he? Demetrius. Is he still here? Is he, is he alive? <laughs> I don't know, but anyway. He would tell you what architecture is, how to make that architecture, and why would you want to do that? Because there's nothing to discover. Architecture is all about, it's a process of discovery and, um, and uh, exciting yourself. Now, there is a role for the public within all that, because you have to excite them, you have to excite a client, there's all sorts of people in architecture. But the first responsibility is to excite yourself. Because if you're excited, you are an ordinary human being. Sometimes I think architects are not human beings, but you, we are, we take both roles. <laughs> And therefore, the chances of that being of interest to others is higher. So you have to be excited. I'm still talking to you. <laughs> I suppose, look, I should explain, this is an extremely long lecture. So you tell, tell me <laughs> when to stop, okay? I never got to the end of this talk, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I should have started at the back, actually. I, I can't remember what the back is now. <laughs> So that's how I feel. Still active, <laughs> but a bit beaten up. <laughs> but I used to be younger. <laughs> this is at this point you're supposed to say, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't talk about that. I just want to race through a few things which you've probably seen before if you're at the last talk. <laughs> Was anyone at the last talk? That's good. <laughs> Apart from the old boys <laughs> and girls. <laughs> oh, good, I can say whatever I like. Good. <laughs> now, I just wanted to remind you of a few things. Uh, Willie mentioned that I paint, and this was actually earlier this year, in Sicily somewhere. They gave me an award in Sicily, which made me feel really old. It was a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> 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 oh, wow, I can stop now. <laughs> but it was marvellous food and drink, and a funny sort of glass thing they gave me. But they gave me this woman, who <laughs> 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 oh, I left behind, <laughs> but, and, and this young one. And we sort of did this painting as part of the celebration of architecture in Selenumte, which has got a marvelous sort of Greek ruins on the beach, worth going to, just for the ruins. The rest of the city is shit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. And I like it because everyone else started to paint on the walls in this car park. I like that. So I do that. This book has been out a while now. It's now being extended and reissued in Italian and English. Out for Christmas, price £24.99, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's called The Noise Reloaded. But no, the, seriously, the point of showing you this is Tom Porter, who wrote the book, I loved him very much, and he died just before it was printed. And he finished writing it. And he's a good guy. And I loved talking to him. And actually, sometimes the role of the architectural writer or critic or whatever you like to call them is to talk to you. And talking is one way of talking things into existence. I tend not to do that, but I think I understand that that's a possibility at the moment. For a long time, I thought Jean Nouvel, the well-known French architect, he definitely talks things into existence. He doesn't draw. I, I don't, I'm not sure he can draw, actually. <laughs> I've never seen him with a pencil in his hand. And um, he's a nice man, but he talks a lot. And in his studio, there are many ways of doing things, making things, is he has a, 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 a poet called uh, Olivier Boisson, and he's the guy that he talks to. So this is a new project. First thing is out for lunch, wine, Let's talk our way into it. So, and that's what they do. And so when he thinks that, you, that there is an understanding of what the project is, that is then shared with a smaller team. And then it starts to take on some 
physical form, and then it becomes a process of criticism and refining. That's good. I tend not to do that, but I, it's not too late. It's not too late, because I have painted things and drawn things into existence, which I think is more of my metier. But on the other hand, as you get older, that's really tiring. <laughs> and talking is more relaxing, <laughs> in a way. And you can, be, other people can open your mind, but certainly discussion and listening <coughs> is a part of the process. And then, you see, with his dad, Bruce, who's probably my best friend. Sounds a bit childish now, oh, it's my best friend. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a close friend, I think you're supposed to say. Um, he and I have spent hours just staring at things and doing things, apropos of nothing. Now, that's quite good. This happens to be in Menorca, where he has a, a farm, which is a sort of studio. But it's a wonderful place to go. You have your morning sessions of, of painting or making things, starting about 7.30-ish. Then it gets a bit too hot by about 10.30, so you then have breakfast. And then you go back later in the day for the gin and tonic session at about 5.30. And then the sun goes down, and then you have, have dinner. And, it's a, it's, and you, can, you actually end up doing a lot, but you don't know what you're going to do before you get there. That's the point. And you discover things. But this thing, it's like practice. You know, it's not called architectural practice for no reason. It's the same as tennis. So you have to keep doing it and doing it and doing it, whether there's a job, someone's asked you to do something, or whether it's your own sense of inquiry, which I think is very important. All the technology, which I'm supposed to be talking to you about, and we might, <laughs> comes from somewhere else. You know, it's not the blind application of technology, although it's good to be aware of what's going on, and certainly technology has advanced in my own lifetime unbelievably. You, know, you can build things today which you couldn't build when I was 30 years younger. Or you could, but it would have been really difficult and too expensive. So things have changed a lot for the better. But if you don't know what you want to do with that technology, then that's useless, isn't it? So you've got to be interested in it, and you've got to know when, you might, when it might be applicable to what it is you're trying to achieve. But this process helps a lot. I can assure you the exploration of shadows, it is Menorca, and there's a lot of sun, and there's a lot of shadows. And that's come out many times on our annual um, working sessions. Sometimes we work in London, but not so much. But you finish it, you take photographs, and then you find that maybe three or four years later, something that you did actually finds its way, for some reason, into a project. So everything that you do might seem a bit pointless, albeit enjoyable at the time, but it comes out later on, when you least expect it. This is a project which was commissioned by the mayor of um, Ereville St. Clair, which is near Caen in Normandy. Who I, I like this mayor a lot. And he'd been mayor of this new town from the age of 23. And he was only 46 when we, when we uh, were commissioned to, to look at this. And he, and he was a minister for housing, I think, in central government in Paris, because all the mayors often do a spate in central government in Paris. So that was good. So he said he wanted a new building. And the idea of this building is a building by four different architects. So it's a bit like playing consequences. So at the bottom is me, which is shops and an aviary. I've always thought if you're dragged off shopping, you need something else to look at that's not the shops. So you can look at the shop or you can look at the parrot. And I moved out from the ground floor, which I suppose, well, it is the ground floor, but I moved it out from under the tower element. And then the, um, the office element at the bottom of the, of the bit is um, Massimiliano Fuxas. I could tell you a lot of stories about Fuxas, but I, later in the bar. <laughs> always a very unfortunate name. And he always said, oh, really, I never get a job in London. I said, no, you never will. You have to change your name. <laughs> I always thought he should go into partnership with Wolf Pricks. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> never mind. That's a, that's a. 
So that's Massimiliano. Still a friend. And this guy is dead, Otto Steidler, for the housing. Very serious German. Very nice German. I liked him a lot. And he was very worried about this. M much more worried than Massimiliano about the whole thing. Anyway. And then this is a Chinese restaurant and a hotel, and that's Jean Nouvel. What impressed me, because I never expected that we'd build this, and indeed we didn't build it, but the, the central government in Paris took this very seriously. And they're on the edge of writing a check. I thought, oh, ooh. <laughs> but they didn't. Uh, but I like this idea, you know, that no one was really responding to anyone else. There's four completely selfish acts, one on top of the other. <laughs> <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, so people are always talk, will tell you, no doubt, that you, know, you have to behave and you have to be contextual and you have to be um, compliant. There was no compliance here at all. It was a sort of game of, fuck you, I'm going to outdo you. <laughs> <laughs> But is it any the worse for that? I don't know. I don't know if it's a good building or not. That's, that's quite beyond the point. But it was good to do that. And it's not too late. Somebody else can do that. You know, Three or four architects get together and see what happens. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. We might come back to that. This is a thing I like about this building, which is in Dusseldorf. It's an office building is that it's a very, um, we, we did refurb this building as a monument, but then in this narrow gap we built this office building. I can't remember how many floors it is. I, I do remember that it's not actually quite high enough because I think the proportion is wrong, but that's not my fault. But because it's a very tight site, it was better to only have one escape stair, which you can do in Germany providing at each floor you come out into open air. So these balconies are all outside, so the, the, just down there somewhere is a staircase, and you had to force outside and then you go back down the staircase. Hey, that's quite good, because it means that everyone who smokes only has to go a short distance. <laughs> no one, because you could smoke in the offices when I built this building, but now I realize what an advantage that is. You know, down at the bottom in the front door, there are no cigarette ends at all. They've all thrown them off down the side here. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it is a tower. What I was trying to do, and I think we failed, was to make uh, like a tower of colour so you couldn't see how many floors it was. That was actually very difficult to achieve. And, um, but there it is. It's all right. Then they gave it a horrible name called the Calorium. How could they come up with that name? Well, they are Germans. Any Germans in the room? Hi, lovely to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the, and you, the idea that you came over this orange-like lake on the, green plin, on the green slope, and then you go to your elevator and that's it. It's all right. But it's interesting when you look back, when you've done a few works, you realize, look, see that detail of the cross, the inset light on the ceiling? I don't think I've got a photograph later on of OCAD in Toronto. I did the same thing. I didn't know I was doing the same thing. It's interesting, isn't it? The, it just proves my point. We all gather bad habits. Beware of the bad habit. <laughs> Smaller scale, beach cafe, Jersey. Now, I'm not saying it's a great building. There's a terrible end to it. It should just be one piece of glass. Anyway, it's not. But what I like about this is that it's on the beach, and the idea was that it would open in round about Easter and close near early October for the season. Well, it's never closed since it opened. You know, so how you judge the success of work, I think, is quite important. And I would say this is successful because it's never closed. So it's been taken on board by the locals when there are very few tourists in Jersey. No one from Jersey is there. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> because it's called La Frigette, okay? Not my choice. On this site, they made 
they used to make wooden boats, not unlike this. And you see there is a bit of a clue in, in what we did. It's called the upturned boat. And Tony Bullivant, who you probably don't know, Bullivant, the guy that got trapped on his upturned yacht in the Southern Ocean, for <laughs> he was invited to open this. I've never met such a tedious guy in all my life. But anyway, <laughs> all he could talk was about how horrible it was being an upturned boat. And I thought, well, there's more to life than just that. I feel very sorry for you, but no, never mind. <laughs> but they built 670 boats on this site over two or 300 years, I'm not sure. So I thought this should be called um, 671, or Cafe 671, or something like that. So it would actually complete that whole wasn't allowed to do that because, they say, it doesn't sound French. Now, as you know, Jersey is very close to the French uh, um, mainland. Uh, but why? Because what I've discovered on Jersey, they all pretend to be French, but no one can speak French. <laughs> it's a sort of charade that they put out. So be very careful of Jersey people. Now this is part of a, this is in Valencia. I'm, I'm just trying to show you a sort of range of sort of scales because I think, you know, sometimes you're judged, oh, you do wonderful large projects. They're not always the best projects, not always the most interesting. And if you can, it's good to always be open to do things of different s sizes and scale because there's some things you can hold within your head if it's small, and that's great. And you can play with it and everything else. This actual this bar also with, uh, with 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 Bruce in Valencia and part of the Biennale, and we made a department store, um, and that was the the the, the piece. So it had a department. This was the department of drinking. There was a department of smoking. There was a department of sex. You shouldn't go there. And um, <laughs> a department of dancing. All sorts of things. And it was really good. Just parallel lines of different activity in very particular places, and. Um, I think it was Bruce's idea on this bar. There were little contact mics under the bar, so there's a bit of concrete, steel, wood. So you suddenly realize that by the way you placed your glass, you could actually play a tune on the bar, at least you could make noises. It encouraged people to go up and down. And a minor point, maybe, but important. Will we'll refer to, uh, to this building in Marseille. And I think uh, this is an important building for me because I beat Norman Foster <laughs> and that was good. And it was a good feeling because he's, he's older than me um, and he w was seen to be unbeatable. Anyway, we beat him. But that's not, really, that's not really what I want to say. What I want to say is that we worked very carefully on this building so that you would have no air conditioning, it would all be naturally cooled, use the, um, the, 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 the mass of the building to cool down with the night air, the hollow slabs, so you could bring the night air through, all of that. All the windows could be opened, I mean it's mainly an office building, and then with this political part contained behind with the uh, debating chamber and the p politician's bar, which I realize is where actually where all the decisions are taken. And the debate is just a charade as well. They already know how everyone's going to vote. They know the result. You think, well, why bother? It's just to keep the general public happy. <laughs> However, this was an early attempt and at trying to do something that was actually responsible. Now, in the end, the client said, we have to have some air conditioning. He said, well, you don't need it. We've spent ages and ages proving to you and you seem to accept it. Why do you want air conditioning? Because if we don't have air conditioning, we'll see, be seen to be old-fashioned. That's interesting, isn't it? So it's nothing to do with whether you need it or not. It was what the message that you put out to the rest of the world at that time. So that was a bit disappointing. We didn't put much air conditioning, but it does have some air conditioning in it. And um, the other thing they wanted was that there should be natural light, natural ventilation, in all the offices, okay, that's fine, that's great. Then you realize that the people working there actually don't like the sun. It took me a long time to understand this. So when they go into their office, they pull the blinds down and work under one small light. A beautiful sunny day outside, and you think, oh, ugh, why do they do that? You know, but I didn't know that before we started to design the building. It could have saved a lot of money by having no windows at all. <laughs> uh, 
which would have been okay too. But I was proud of this building. I still am proud of this building. But I am interested in this question of how you measure success. And all I'd say about this building, apart from its piece of architecture, it's in the northern part of Marseille, which is very run down. And now if you go to that part of Marseille today, it's not run down. So that, mind you, if you put 2,000 people working in a rundown area, it will change the area anyway. But it also has 750, it's settled down to 750,000 visitors a year coming to see the architecture. Now that's not bad, really, and it's now quite old, this building. 1994, this one. This is the year, by winning this, we, it, the, op the office went from BC, before computer, <laughs> to AC, which is all computer, and it was a bit of a struggle, but anyway, we had to do that, and there are early sort of elements of using, it wasn't called BIM, but all the consultants had to use the same computer programs, and all the information was then printed and overlaid, and automatically it would say, where's the clash of information? And you get these horribly complicated drawings with a round ring on them, so you knew you got a problem there, but it didn't tell you what the bloody problem was. <laughs> which is a bit unfortunate, but it, of course today you can do that with 3D and you can actually see where the clash is or, 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 where, or where the problem might be. Uh, then you couldn't, but it seemed to be modern, you see. The French like to be modern. Any French people here? Bonsoir. <laughs> that's two or three, that's not bad. You studying here? Bola? Yes, amazing. Really? You're learning anything? <laughs> Don't answer that question. <laughs> anyway, I like working in France because the food is better. That's <laughs> yeah, very sensible, I think. And you know, lunchtime is lunchtime. And it's not one hour; it's sort of like two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, it's good. <laughs> and there are many other stories about that, but it was a very enjoyable period of our, of, of of my life doing this. And it was very instructive, and it was one of the first buildings, well, not the first, but one of the first ones to begin to look at energy reduction and alternative ways of doing things. It's not hard, because if you're an old hippie like me, you know, we were uh, studying at the AA at the time, all, all sorts of people making, experimenting with uh, windmills, with recycling their own shit on allotments. <laughs> no, the self-build, all of that. Um, community, television, things in the early days of video. It was interesting. Yeah, and the whole Earth catalogue, which you may or may not know about, was a sort of Bible. You go out and you're doing these things. And you knew, we knew, you had to do something because the planet was under threat. But if you then go to business at that time, you say, well, this, this is important. They say, that doesn't count. You smoke dope and you're a hippie. Didn't listen to all those people. But actually, we were right. But of course, you do have to get a bit older, back to my theme, so that people begin to listen to you. And of course, it's still a long way behind now as to what you could do. And even to this day, if you're trying to do the responsible thing in the design of one of your structures or whatever, you'll often find it costs a little bit more. It's getting better, but a little bit more. There's a lot of resistance because there's a lot of people who want to make maximum profit out of what you do. In this country, it's no wonder we have a housing crisis because the people that build the houses are not the... Oh, we should just build council houses and be done with it. Because the people building these houses in the private sector, they're looking to make 30 or 40 percent profit. That's a big profit. The people constructing these places also are making a large profit some anywhere between 15 and 25 percent profit. The people that sold the land are wanting to make a big turn on the land. And what are you left with as the designer or anything else? You're left with either something that's so small you shouldn't be living in it. And I hate architects that proudly say, you see it in the, in the magazines, you know, oh look, I've just invented a micro flat. You should be shot. <laughs> <laughs> that's not very useful, you know. Why do I, I'm quite big, do I want to live in a micro flat? No, thank you very much. Uh, and what, what, hap what you want is space, space is the luxury. 
what it looks like, what it's made of, perhaps doesn't really matter. But space, now you can enjoy space, can't you? And we just need to get those profit margins down, go back to the local authorities to build council houses. And you could buy them. You don't have much money. But you could have a 60-year mortgage, couldn't you? It doesn't really matter. Uh, because the money comes back into the public sector anyway. And that would be better. So I can't stand architects that say, I'm going to solve the housing problem. They don't. They make it worse. And you know, so there were the, uh, what were the housing standards called? Um, Parker Morris, you see. That was supposed to be minimum size of the flat. Today, Parker Morris standards looks like luxury. <laughs> Huge. And it's not being done. And yet there's people like Tony Pidgeley and all these horrible Barclay homeless people riding around in their airplanes, buying up large chunks of Florida, uh, building golf courses. I mean, it's just horrible. I'm not a communist, but I think I am. And why not? I mean, I just think it's appalling what goes on, particularly in this city, but it applies to the whole country and beyond. Although in Germany, there's a German person over there. I've done quite a lot of work. I work for people like Strabag, large contractor, and they will, they will sometimes develop them things themselves. And they say, out of both the investment and the construction, they aim to make 75 to 8% profit over the whole lot. Of course, they're very slow because they want to make sure they will make that, which is fair enough. They build very well. Not always the most interesting, I have to say, but it doesn't matter. And they do it. So the price of an apartment, or to, well, more to rent than, than, than very often to buy in those days, is realistic. Because no one is being too greedy, and they make enough money to live quite well themselves. I think that's great. How come we evolved a society here where you are patted on the back for screwing somebody else? And we're screwing ourselves, really. Anyway, that got me off the point that most architects just fuck around trying to do something because it looks clever. And it's very, very rarely is clever. <coughs> it's quite a nice building, anyway. <laughs> That's the front. <laughs> Now, I quite like, I'm not saying this is a great piece of architecture, but we did it. And it's the media stand and the main grandstand at Headingley Cricket Ground in Leeds. The trouble with having some foreign people here, you don't know what cricket is, do you? <laughs> it's a marvellous game that you should actually begin to study. Because <laughs> it takes, well, the big matches take five days. And of course, it's a very civilised game because you stop for lunch. Stop for tea, and then you have a few drinks afterwards. Mm -hmm. No, it's great. And the weather comes into, into, into it. And everything. Anyway, I won't bore you with cricket now, but it's very relaxing and can be very exciting. If it's not exciting, it doesn't matter. You've had strawberries and cream and a glass of champagne. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> and but I like this, what I like about this building is that it's not a cricket pavilion all the time. It's also a part of Leeds Metropolitan University. So in the winter, when we don't play cricket, it actually is part of this. And they also have catering facilities, and they train chefs, and they, they still work for all the big cricket matches during the summer. I like that. So there's two uses in one building. Geoffrey Boycott, who's on the board of the cricket club. See, you don't know Geoffrey Boycott. But I can assure you, he's a bloody difficult northern man. <laughs> and he looked at this and he said, that's bloody awful. <laughs> then he came around and he said, I think it's bloody great. So that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another way of measuring success. These are apartments all gone in Rotterdam. And there's a church attached. And there's a few offices and there's a few shops. And this is part of a big master plan we did for the Central Station in Rotterdam, and also zipping up the city, and it was a big, big project. Anyway, we did, we built this bit. The station has been built by another architect, but it's actually virtually what we drew in the first place, so that's okay. And these are very simple apartments. What interests me here, I didn't know this at the time, but 
See, this it's all one building really, but broken down so it breaks down the mass. This red bit, 80% was bought by Chinese because it's red. <laughs> no, it's amazing. <laughs> I, I'm just passing this knowledge on. It might be useful to you one day. <laughs> you never know. All these apartments have, and they're not expensive apartments by any means. They have all have underground, under, underground, underfloor heating and cooling. So there's nothing on the walls. So you can put your sofa wherever you want to put your bloody sofa, <laughs> which is quite good. Then I also discovered on this, in the balconies, by bringing down things in front of the balconies, the balcony becomes more usable. Because you, know, you, you go around London or a lot of other cities, and you look at all the balconies, and everyone says, we must have balconies. And you look at these balconies, and they're full of dead plants and dead bikes and dirty washing. <laughs> it was clean when they put it out there, but it became dirty. <laughs> uh, but here they actually use the balcony. You know, they have their gin and tonics or whatever it is at the right time of day. I was quite proud of that. But I believe it's only because we put some things in front. So it's not the whole open balcony. There's a restriction to the view. So actually, using a very non-architectural word, the balcony has a certain cosy factor to it. People like to feel cosy. I'll pass you on that for now. I've been to a lot of architects' houses, and you probably have too. And I'm always glad to go back to my own clutter. <laughs> No, it's funny. It's all because it's all about style and not about living. And they use their own houses to show what wonderful architects they are. And you look at it, you think, well, maybe you're not. <laughs> I think I never say it to them. I have a marvelous <laughs> house, and, and that's terrific. But, and that bit there, that's, that's the church. We did knock down the church um, in order to build the church. It sounds a bit odd. <laughs> but... Um, my client said, I, the church people would like to meet you, which seemed a perfectly reasonable request to me. And um, so I, I did have a meeting. <coughs> I went into a large room, probably about the size of this room, big round table, and there were about 20 of them sitting around the table, all drinking. I thought, this is okay. <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> would you like a drink, Mr. Olson? Yes, thank you very much. And I um, and <laughs> said, we have a few questions for you. Yes. First question was, do you believe in God? I said, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> I believe I could make a space that will lift the spirit. That seemed to satisfy them, and then everything else was easy after that. And we built this. It's not just a church. Behind it, there are uh, rooms where they put up um, refugees and look after them. In the basement, there's what they call a cocktail bar, which is full of drugs, so they look after the, the drug addicts. They do a lot of good work. And they, Mr. McLean, most of the people who go, uh, who are doing their sort of Sunday service in the church, they're all dressed in tweed and brogues, <laughs> funny enough. Very sort of upright looking people, which is great. And they're very nice people, actually. So anyway, I, b I built the church and I, about two years ago I, and, and gave a lecture in the church for Architecture Day in Rotterdam. And there was the priest sitting in the audience. A nice man. And he came up to me and said, after I'd finished, he said, Ah, Professor Olsop, I've been elevated by that time. He said, you do believe in God. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? I'm uh, quite loud. I've been converted without knowing it. <laughs> I didn't build this, but this is, you know, China features will probably feature in your lives more than it features in my early part. But I've done quite a lot in China, and we might get that far. I don't know how we're doing for time. But this is, I like this one because it's two museums, one on top of the other. <coughs> this is supposed to be a film, but actually, yeah, it doesn't work. That's a film that shows what it is. Anyway, we'll pass over that. It's about how the structure grows, and it comes, it's very poetic. <laughs> <laughs> That's another museum, which, uh, anyway, this is the bar in a hotel in Holland. I quite like the Dutch, except I would say, any Dutch people here? <laughs> 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 I think that, you know, there's a reputation, at least to, to us uh, English, 
that the Scots are really mean. Well, they are a bit mean. <laughs> Not with, never with drink. They're always very generous with drink. But actually, I think it's unfair. I think the Scots are the third meanest people. <laughs> people from South Yorkshire are meaner than the Scots. <laughs> and the Dutch are the meanest of all. <laughs> and, but they're great to work with up until you spend serious money. Then they get a bit funny. You know. And all the way through a project, you know, you'll have discussions about the quality of the toilet roll holder in those flats, for example. Ah, because you've got 365 toilet roll holders. If we, go, if we, if we can save five euros on each one, that uh, amounts to a lot of money. Not really, <laughs> not in the context of the whole. In the context of, of, of some cleaner's um, <coughs> weekly wage, yeah, it's a lot of money, <laughs> but not to them. So they are odd, but I, I did this hotel in Almira. I liked working in Almira because when I was born, it was sea. And I remember my geography teacher, say, when I was about 14, explaining how they're going to drain parts of the Zyder Z to turn it into land and the whole polder technology which I found fascinating. Little did I think I'd actually be building <coughs> some buildings on this area that he was talking about. Things change quite quickly in your life. And, and you'll observe this. So some of you will be saying, you know, one day I was doing this, blah, 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 blah. And now look, I'm doing that. I'd never have imagined I'd be doing that. You must be ready for that. I like that. And the things that get away. Look, this is the reoccurrence of the shadows for a ferry station in Dubai. And also trying to make, reduce the, the amount of space where you can wait, which is air conditioned, but trying to promote as much breeze through this as possible. Because wind, or breeze, is actually about 45% of the feeling of feeling cooler. You know, the actual temperature is not so important. It is important, but it's not so important. It's to feel the movement of air, which is important. But you still need to provide somewhere in July and... Where do you come from? And my parents are from East Africa. But I was born here. Uh, but, well, quite, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't care. Um, just say you come from Dubai, please. <laughs> it's good. No, damn it. Um, <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> Some of, I'm sure some of you have been to or know yes. Dubai. I've been there. And July and yes. August are just Morning impossible, aren't they? I mean, so you do need some places to, to get away from. Anyway, that's enough of that. This is a passive house built out of pallets by my students in Vienna. That's quite good, isn't it? I'll tell you one difference between teaching in Vienna and teaching in an institution here. In Vienna, you can get, it's much easier to get sponsorship, to do things. So it's quite normal when this, I mean, this is all made out of pallets, so I mean, they weren't difficult to get hold of. And it's the installation, there's a full kitchen in there, bathroom, all donated, built by the students, and then it's demountable, so that this is actually erected in, in Vienna. But then um, we took it to the Venice Biennale, and some students lived in it for or five weeks. That was that was good. It was really good. Uh, it's not expensive, you know. If you actually, I can't remember the figures now, but it's very cheap, very quick, and very good. And there are lots of pallets in the world, aren't there? I thought they did a good job, really good job. It's an art school. That's the view. <laughs> now the views. I think are one of the most important things for you to think about. Uh, because you are in control of what you see of, of whatever it is you're going to design and build. And you have to think about that. And if you think, if you lived in some miserable house in, well, I won't say where, and with a very little view, or no, in Hong Kong, anyone from Hong Kong? There you go, bad luck. <laughs> it, it's nice. <laughs> But you know, some the, the, the distance between some of those blocks is just, that's why people get ill. That's another story. There's not enough air circulation. And then with that very humid air, things form. Anyway, that's not what I wanted to say. Some views from bedroom windows in Hong Kong look at another miserable 
bedroom window, just very close. Mm. I just want you to imagine waking up on Christmas morning as, an, as a 10 year old child, thinking, oh, it's Christmas, oh, maybe it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Dreadful. So, you know, that's the worst thing, that on celebration days, you're gonna feel good. But you wanna feel good every day, don't you? And out of most places, you can extract a view. It's your job to make, it doesn't have to be a long view like, 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 like this one here, you know, that's London in front of you. But there is something, you can divide up, you can obscure the view, you can play with some light or shadows or whatever. That's your responsibility because you can control that. And it makes all the difference to the, how you feel when you're inside the building. It's not just a window, it's much more than that. And you have to think about that. And the component, what is the window, you know? How does it work? How do you clean it? No, no, that's boring. But you know what I mean. Thank you very much. I can't remember what year this building was. Probably about 1988. And we built it because we did the, the bar we created the lake and the barrage in Cardiff. Uh, which is important, but en route, we changed South Cardiff a lot. But our client said, uh, we need a building, a temporary building, to actually tell the people of Cardiff what's going to happen to their city and how it's changing, and we can meet people and have meetings. Um, somewhere we can have exhibitions, somewhere we can take people who might like to invest in this part of Cardiff and, and show them what's going on. Anyway, in the, I'm sure I've said this to you before, in the absence of any other idea, you look at your cigarette lighter and say, that would make a good building. It okay. doesn't matter where, and it's not an idea. I'm very suspect of ideas, and, but it was just an opportunity, let's call it. So you measure your cigarette lighter, blow it up to the appropriate size, and there you go. <laughs> it's a very yeah. simple building. Supply is a steel frame, some, um, some plywood with funny sort of shapes cut out of it, and then some insulation, and then a skin, which is exactly the same skin as you see back on, 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 on the back of lorries, and with the same clips that clip that skin down there. All the weight comes down there, and then it's stabilized by this. Simple, not expensive. And my client said, oh, we expect 25,000 people a year. It did 350,000 people a year. And then the people of Cardiff, who actually objected to this temporary building going there, but you could never trust the Welsh. Any Welsh here? <laughs> 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 but then they decided they like it. And then the five years was up, and they, they thought they'd build a new building on the, where the, on the site this is occupying. So they get rid of the building. The same people that objected say, you can't do that. We spent all this money on printing postcards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But they decided they liked it. So we spent as much money as it cost to build it in the first place, giving it a longer life and moving it about three or 400 meters around the corner. And there it was until, I don't know, three years ago, four years ago, maybe, something like that. Anyway, it lasted uh, an embarrassing amount of time. What interests me, though, a very simple technology, uh, Neil, Neil Thomas of Atelier One was the engineer, who we're still working with today, and who I love dearly. He's good fun, and a great fan of David Bowie. Not that that has anything to do with his work, but I just thought I'd mention it. Because <laughs> my wife's a great fan of David Bowie, and they seem to like each other a lot, and sometimes I worry about this. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to mo more Bowie exhibitions than you can shake a stick at, I tell you. That's trying to keep my wife happy. I never invite Neil. Anyway. Um, <laughs> this building has been copied all over the world. I've seen it in Holland. I've seen it in Germany. I've seen it particularly in China where they copy everything. That's fine. <laughs> I don't mind that. But I just wa want you to know, that was the first one. <laughs> okay? And it came from my cigarette lighter. 
didn't come from looking at some other arsehole's work. And ar architects are pirates, and I think that's okay. I think you can steal things. That's, that's another way of thinking about how you work. But so sometimes it's nice to be first. And then if people copy, don't get upset, because it's a compliment. That's what you have. Anyway, I like that building a lot. This is a hotel in Beijing. Art school. Ah, oh, this is under construction at the moment in Toronto. Um, these columns. I, actually, I'm going there next week to take some proper photographs because it will be open towards the end of next year. We've got two metro stations. This is Finch, and I work with, with Bruce on the structure of this. That's a prehistoric, they're much better than they look on this particular rendering. But it's interesting, we won that job for two. There's originally supposed to be one architect per station, a bit like our Jubilee line here. But actually, when I went for the interview, they said, what is going to drive your uh, design process? Didn't have design in it, it's not a competition, which is good, I hate competitions. We might get onto competitions later, but I said, I think I can design a station where two people who don't need, know each other might fall in love. So they gave me two stations. <laughs> Lack of love in Toronto, you know, but uh, <laughs> you need to promote as much as you can. But it, it was, it's been a very nice process working for them. This is a, a, a station called Finch. And this is the bus station on top of the other one, which is called Steels. That's not why this is in steel, okay? Just, they anyway, they changed the name to Pioneer Village, you know, the sort of thing Canadians do. Any Canadians here? <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Canadians always say sorry before you've done anything. <laughs> but I think this is going to be all right. This is, this is steels under construction. Station, I quite like stations. So Blackfriars Station, which is a station on the bridge, we worked on from inception. It was called Thameslink 2000, because it was supposed to be finished in 2000. Was it finished in 2000? No. <laughs> was it finished in 2010? No. <laughs> but it is finished now, so that's okay. But the whole thing, that was, I'm, the great thing about putting a station on the bridge is it serves both sides of the river, which actually reflected how we've changed our attitude towards the south side of the river. And it's fully accepted that if you arrive at this station, you could go north and you could go south. So it's a sort of infrastructural station from a pedestrian point of view, and that's good, I think. But the, the other driving thing is not to impede the view from the road bridge of St. Paul's Cathedral. What a nightmare. <laughs> because actually the trains that were always parked on the bridge do get in the in, in way of that view. So there are going to be trains there anyway. And you think, no, wouldn't it be better just to try and make a beautiful station and just bugger the view? <laughs> because you can get a view of St. Paul's from lots of other places. And, but there are these static points. And anyway, that drove, first thought we had was to build a roof that was so high you could see St. Paul's under the roof. <laughs> they didn't like that. <laughs> oh, that changes the sky and the setting. Of the, I think, oh, God. Yeah. So we did bring it down as low as we can, and of course what's built today, which is, which is this, um, is as low as it can possibly be. It still blocks the view of St. Paul's, <laughs> but we've suffered, therefore it's all right. <laughs> it should be higher. But it's actually quite a pleasant, I mean it's a great station to arrive at, because you're on the river, you can see up and down, and therefore that experience of being in a station, and it's another station in North Greenwich that we did, but the whole point of doing a station really is you should ideally sp be spending as little time as possible in it, and you have to remember that people get these trains in January on a Monday morning at 7 o'clock when it's raining, going to some horrible job they wish that they were dead at. <laughs> they do. You could at least try and cheer them up a bit. You know? <laughs> That's your function. And um, on this station, I wanted to, it was, a, it was called a cut and cover station. So you dig a big hole and then you put a lid on it and then 
that's how it's constructed. And then you put earth back on, and there's the earth. That's why it's called the underground. But this time, this is well before the dome. No one had even thought about the dome when we were commissioned to do this. And um, in a long time, trying to realizing that actually you could dig a big hole, 400 meters long, 25 meters deep, 30 meters wide. If you put a razor sharp edge around it, and then just local protection from the rain, you didn't have to have a roof. It would be spectacular as a whole. And you save a lot of money on smoke ventilation and all of that sort of thing, which costs a fortune. And it would be safer at that time, because I could see nothing ever happening around this station, but I was wrong on that. Um, but for you know, a young person, particularly a young lady, down there late at night, they'd have contact with the, with the surface of the earth. It would feel safer. Your screams could be heard. <laughs> well, I think things like that are quite important. You know, there'd be lighting, of course. No doubt there'd be CCTV. But it's good to have a scream. But I wasn't allowed to do that, sadly. So I added, in a fit of peak, I said, OK, if we can't have daylight in there and air, I'll uh, make it very dark blue. So it's uh, not really a fit of peak. I thought it should be that, because you've got this enclosed environment. If you make it a very dark color, it's a bit like Piranesi. You, know, you can't really see the edges of, of, of the space that's contained. Therefore, it becomes more mysterious. And you actually try and work with that particular experience. This is inside. This is a seminar room inside um, some medical research laboratories down at Whitechapel. I like this room for similar reasons that I like the, uh, the, the, the underground station. It's because you don't know how big it is. Because of the, of the, it's just a, a cup which holds the audience and, and presenter, surrounded by actually this, like a butyl rubber which is pulled. So there's no sharp edges. Again, particularly when the lights are dimmed, you can't see the edges of this room. You don't know how big it is. And I always imagine, I don't know whether it's true, that most seminars are really boring. <laughs> and, it light, and because it's sort of quite dark and soft space, <laughs> you could go to sleep unnoticed. <laughs> Let me say you can go to sleep over there. <laughs> I'm a, how long do I talk for now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, it felt like that. Sorry. No, no, I'm just going to flash it. Uh, that's what's going on tonight. Just let me get... I, I'm going to finish soon because it's difficult standing up all that time. That's a car park. That was a failure. These are um, condominiums in Canada. <laughs> I'm having the devil's own job. I think I'm winning now. I'm getting permission for this. I have to say, much as I love Toronto, and I love the Canadians, when you start getting into some of the sort of inner city neighborhoods, they really are bastards. <laughs> It's as though you have no right to build anything without my personal position, um, permission. No, no, no. It's horrible. And it's quite nice, but I have changed a bit now. But it's more or less that's what we're doing. And um, I think now we've gone through. The, but it's taken two and a half years to get to this position where it looks as though we might get permission to do it. That's absurd, really. That's a, that's a museum. You've seen this before, haven't you? And it's all about Bradford and working with the whole city. So it's about the scale of working. It's a bit old, this one.
Now we spent a year, more or less, working with people in Bradford about how their city could be better and what they wanted and their vision for their city and then trying to make sense of it. And uh, so made this film with Squint Opera, which is my son. You'll be pleased to know. I'm not sure he is. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, and we, we used that film in local cinemas because we couldn't reach everyone in Bradford, obviously. So we went to the police, the old people, the young people, you know, the business community, the politicians, all of them, getting them to draw and to dream and then try to make sense of it and came up with our basic sort of vision. It was good, wasn't it? You, you enjoyed that, didn't you? <laughs> but look, much to my surprise, we then built a bit of the vision, and there it is, which is like the heart of Bradford. You can drain this lake, so you, you know, if it is a hard surface where they could gather and celebrate if they ever won the World Cup in anything, which is highly unlikely, <laughs> but there must be other things to celebrate. Um, or you can half drain it, and you can, you can then, it's then very safe for children to paddle and play, out, or indeed adults to play in. Um, or it can be full with the fountains and all the rest of it. I think that's quite a nice story. Okay, there's a bit of a gap between preparing the film and the vision and gathering the money for this, but anyway, they did get the money together. And actually, I think it's quite successful. I'm quite proud of that. So it's not always building. Maybe the main thing here was clearing away buildings <coughs> in order to see the wood for the trees. So there's some fine buildings in Bradford cra just destroyed on the, this, going back to the view, like the police station, it was very popular when I suggested that we get rid of the police station. I don't know, it was a good move. But obscured the view of the town hall, which is a magnificent Victorian building. Because Bradford was a very rich city at one time. It doesn't feel that way now. But it's about putting some sense of pride and, and focus. So there's no town centre in Bradford. Three ring roads right around quite a small city. You get rid of the inner ring road, you, get, you don't need it. You probably don't need the other one either, but anyway. It might be a step too far. But let's start in the middle, not on the edge, somewhere, in the middle. And there's some other th quite good things that have been done, and it's a, an ongoing process, of course. That no notion of change has to start somewhere, and a bit of water might be a good place to start. Here's a bit of children's school. There's a nursery school. There's the ICI, ICA alongside... <laughs> Look, there's the Tate Modern in the background. What a bit of disappointment the Tate Modern is, don't you? Don't you agree? Oh, you don't agree? Well, you should agree. <laughs> Think about it. Is it a great ga set of gallery spaces? Compare <coughs> the gallery spaces in the Tate Modern to the gallery spaces in the Royal Academy. There is no comparison in terms of the quality of the space. The other thing I object to about the, the, uh, the Tate Modern is you're guided around it in the same way that you're guided around Ikea. <laughs> you, someone is controlling you, and it's not you controlling yourself. I don't think it's good, I'm sorry to say. I'm not getting at Hedgehog and Moran. We put buildings on top of buildings. This is in Hamburg on top of an old warehouse, or glass. And that's not putting a building. It looks as though we put a building on top of a building, but we built the whole thing, just down the road. Ah, yes, <coughs> now this is my grumpy bit. Maybe I should finish on the grumpy bit. This is recreation space for students in Glasgow. This is where you're supposed to have a good time. <laughs> <coughs> you know, everything's bolted down. Who would bother to steal these bloody seats anyway? You know? <laughs> And of course, Glasgow, compared with London, tends to be a bit chilly. <laughs> Why? I mean, it's just horrible. Why would you do that? Why would anyone build that building? <laughs> <laughs> Car park in front, etc. It might be in Canada. I don't know where this is. Do you recognize that? It's not one of yours, is it? <laughs> 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 But it's weird, because that could be anywhere. We've all seen this building everywhere. And yet, why does no one complain about this? If someone, you know, you might do a ghastly piece of work, but well-intended, 
uh, with a lot of thought that goes into it, and people object to it. But you could do this, and no one even t t <laughs> turns a hair. Something wrong, isn't there? That trains you not to put your head above the parapet. Look, do you really want to live in that? Lots of people do, but they build these because it's all to do with the market, what they sold before. Therefore, it was sold before, they'll, they'll keep on repeating it. And also, for many people, they have no choice. That's what they can afford. And then they park the car in the front drive. On Sunday, they clean the car. They get home a bit late at night because they probably had a two-hour train journey or whatever it is, feeling a bit tired, maybe one too many beers on the train, beat up the wife, go to bed, have an argument. I mean, just <laughs> It's just a nightmare, really, isn't it? <laughs> you just know it. <laughs> Horrible. Look. This is a motorway service station. Did you design that? <laughs> well, it looks like you could have done. <laughs> isn't that horrible? You know, Marks, sim Marks and Spencer's Simply Food, Costa. I mean... They sell a lot of petrol here. I suspect they make quite a lot of money. <coughs> Why couldn't... Look at that portico. Steps going up, not good for the disabled. I think they can creep up a thing on the side. But I mean, there is no excuse. A motorway service station should be marvellous, shouldn't it? You think, I'm really looking forward to stopping for a glass of wine and getting drunk. No, no. <laughs> 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 you know. It's a, 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 a marvellous exotic piss, uh, all of those things. I mean, but it's not like that. You think, oh, God, I've got to stop because either I really do need to go to the toilet or I need petrol. That's the only reason you stop. You never stop for any other reason, would you? I just think it's, I think it's criminal. But they go up all over the place. And, I mean, this is a particularly bad one, but none of them are very good. Oh, look. <laughs> To spend the weekend in this travel lodge, see? <laughs> uh, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? Looks just like the house that you left. <laughs> and when you get old, <laughs> no, this is not the travel lodge. It's where, this is an old person's bedroom <laughs> in an old person's home. Why does it have to look as though you're next to death? <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. But these are useful things that you could think about in your studies. How can you make somebody who's probably not much older than me, I have to say, feel better about going to an old person's home because they might not have... I'm better, so they don't have to go in at all, of course. But then, you know, to escape their room, they go to the recreation area. Oh, look. <laughs> you know, look at that chair. Look at, look at it. That chair there <laughs> says, I'm a chair waiting for an, an old bottom to sit in it. <laughs> it's horrible. I mean, you know that, okay, they, have some, they, can't, they don't want to get too far down because they can't get out. But it doesn't have to be like that, does it? You won't make that mistake. Though. You wouldn't put your parents into that place, would you? <laughs> I bet you would when you get the old. <laughs> <laughs> and then you gather around, you have a nice game of tiddlywinks or whatever it is, and, or rummy, and then you can go back to your bedroom after a disgusting supper. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, these guys are now old enough to go into those homes, the Rolling Stones, <coughs> and no one's responding who builds these places, and they're being built at a rate of knots around the country, and they're thinking that these people are ex-drug addicts, rock, rockers, and all that sort of thing. <coughs> and they're not interested in any of that sort of styling, whereas the other place, the place I just showed you, is carefully styled to appeal to the elderly. Well, the elderly have changed. They don't want that. You know, they'd rather die. <laughs> I was going to talk a little bit about things from the past, but I won't. Look, that's a great building, isn't it? That's a great bit. I think that one's gone now, hasn't it? Yes. Yeah, lovely. Don't build them. Look, and these people are really grumpy about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the whole bit on painting. Oh yeah, how you turn a painting or a drawing into a, into, into a into a work. I like having a big bit of canvas, talking with some of the guys, bits of charcoal, draw on the canvas, bit of paint, photograph it, fiddle with it. And you can put it on the table. <laughs> oh, miss the table. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> I only made that for, for you, that there is a, to show there is a relationship between your attachment to the computer <laughs> and the act of drawing or painting or model making or whatever else it might be. Or if there's a message you need to get across, you know, in this case, this is this, that horrible university in, in Glasgow where there's lots of interesting things going on, but it's invisible to people who live in Glasgow. So uh, uh, our message to them was make the invisible visible. And there you go. <laughs> Then you have to use all the devices you can to do things and blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. Lighting. Why is lighting nearly always static? It could actually sort of move around, couldn't it? Maybe. This is a prison. I spent a long time in prison. And I tell you, I can assure you, that cell is quite luxurious. But in some cells, you lie with your head on the pillow about less than half a meter from the lavatory pan, stainless steel. Marvelous, isn't it? Very nice. And they wonder why there's more than 62% reoffending rates when you're left, let out of prison. Some, some prisoners spend 12 hours <coughs> in these cells because at night there's not enough staff. And that's because they put cells in blocks of 100 or more. And therefore the reduced night staff can't, are not enough to contain a riot. Therefore it's easy to lock them up at 8 o'clock when the night staff come on. Bad, isn't it? They're not allowed, or they're encouraged to keep in touch with their friends and family, particularly their families. So there are phones. And they use a phone card and they're charged at the highest possible rate. I can go on and on about how bad prisons are, but I spent quite a lot of time in prison. That's not so bad. This would be better. Not cell blocks, but prison villas. So that you'd have ideally 12, but it could be 16 prisoners per villa, some external space, for the, for the summer months, where you can actually sit outside, but you can't escape. And you're locked into the villa at night. But there's a proper kitchen where you can cook. And the, each prisoner has a key to their own cell. That's for their own self-protection, because the biggest danger to prisoners are being beaten up by other prisoners. That's what happens. So if you can, you'd put some elderly prisoners together with younger ones, and the younger ones are generally the, the most angry and, and the most difficult. And then you give us, I won't get onto the world of work in prison, it's just uh, appalling. But sometimes there are good things, and they understand if you give them something interesting to do, and they're learning on the job, that's good. So the pr prison I spent some time in, they were actually doing up this sailing vessel which is for children, and they were, they were doing it beautifully. They got the point of what they were doing, and they were learning something as well. There was another bit where they made socks for the prison service, socks that no one wore. And what I discovered is that the ones that were poor, they would wear these socks once. I mean, these socks, you could 
if you owned a pair, you could probably leave them to your great grandchildren. They will never rot, these socks, ever. So that means they're sweaty and they're uncomfortable. So they'd wear them for a day, they'd throw them down the lavatory, it blocks all the drainage system, and then the plumbers have to come. And um, I mean, it's just a nonsense, the whole thing. Everyone knows that, but they, don't really they still have to make these socks that no one wants. That's a pretty pointless thing, and they get paid £12 a week, out of which they might ring home. So <coughs> prison reform is vital. But at the same time as this, you get in the private sector people saying uh, both managing and building prisons. They are the worst. They are the very worst. And they do this because they're cheap. They have no humanity. And yet, I don't know, I think that the, I don't know the current figures, but reoffending rates are going up, not down. So what's to lose in doing this? When I published this, this project, the Daily Mail said, Ulsop wants to send prisoners to holiday camp. That sort of attitude is just, it's not even stupid. It's actually dangerous, irresponsible, and the Daily Mail, or whoever wrote it, should be shot. They should be put in prison themselves and see what they feel. But it's just, it's not good. Anyway, uh, this is our, our model cell. You sit and do some work, you have a bed, you have a proper shower. Communi the communal showers are places where people also, there's a lot of harm and, and bullying and lots of nasty things go on in the shower, which I won't describe to you now. But a sense of dignity is really important. And a sense of purpose. And these are some drawings that some of the prisoners, prisoners did. I, I won't tell you the story, because you know it. No, I won't show you that. You can't have that. I'm bored with that. Oh, this is in, in Canada. The man with the long white hair was the man that used to go out with Suzanne before Leonard Cohen stole, stole her off him. <laughs> anyway, this was a, a community work to work out part of the prison, and they went mad. And it was a, it was a 40, long, 40 meter long tunnel lined in, in, uh, in, in canvas, and you could paint anything you like. I saw one man using his partner as a paintbrush. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> anyway, that's enough. I think, you see, that, this is collective painting with school children at the Royal Academy. That's good, because very often, th these people don't often have to sit looking at a big piece of canvas with lots of paint. You can do what you like. It's somehow liberating. And they're working together on this, under my careful direction. <laughs> But it's great. This is another work with Bruce in, uh, in Menorca. Painting. I don't know why I put that there. Oh, look, there's, an, there's a building, it, which Willie's already given the lecture on this, so I don't need to say <laughs> anything. <laughs> I just wanted to get through. I wanted to end somewhere. I knew it was successful when Johnny Walker Whiskey used it in that advertising campaign. And some student goes to a fancy dress party <laughs> dressed as the building. That must be all right. <laughs> uh, here's some housing. This is current project in Cambridge. Student housing. Uh, some more housing in Battersea, which we're about to start on site. But what I like about this, sorry, is we're building a building over a building. Where I start to think about that? Well, Toronto. So one thing does lead to another. But it does mean that um, you save this building. I, I'm recladding the existing building, milling this over the top without knocking the, the one down below. So you can have two architectures on the same site. I, I quite like that. Then you think, oh, that project with Jean Nouvel and, and Fuchsas and, uh, and Steidler, I showed you near the beginning. Oh, well, mm, oh yeah, maybe that's what it's, you know. You don't know where things come from, it doesn't matter. And it's only when you start looking back at things, you think, well, maybe that's it. But there is a point to doing all sorts of things. And it's not a point maybe in your student life, it might come out in your non-student life you know, later on. Or it might be something you remember on your deathbed. You know, oh yeah, of course, that's where it came from. <laughs> but I'm serious. 
as, 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 as our old friend Mel Gooding would say, nothing is wasted. And it's right. Nothing is lost, I think, is, is the actual term. So we're doing that, and then that, and this is in Liverpool. Housing and the renovation of a, of a listed building in Hope Street. Hope Street is a, is a wonderful street in Liverpool. There's some interesting things in it, the Philharmonic Hall, a cathedral at either end, more or less, one Catholic, the other not. It's called Hope Street. And there's a hotel, very nice hotel. Anyway, that's what we're doing. And I went to see the mayor of Liverpool quite recently. As part of, because the planner said, you should go and see the mayor, mm -hmm. Joe. And Joe, Joe's office is next to the building that I should have built in Liverpool, which I was very angry about, in, uh, for, the, for the city of culture. It's called the Fourth Grace, or the Cloud. And they cancelled it for no good reason. Well, for good reason, but not my fault. So Joe said, I can't do a Liverpudlian accent, it's no point. But anyway, in his broad Liverpudlian accent, he said, come to the window, Will. And from the window of his office, you see where my building was supposed to be. And he just looked at me and said, we made a mistake, didn't we? I said, yes. So now I can do anything I like. <laughs> This is a bus garage, workstations, residential. I'm just going in for planning permission. This is by the, uh, <coughs> the elevated section of the M4. I'm not supposed to show you this. There it is. Oh, dear. Here's a little bit of China. It's a cruise terminal in Shanghai, which is a part of a park, which is a part of these office buildings. You see how friendly I am to smokers. You can come out on every floor, onto a balcony, a little bit of protection, and have a fag. There it is. Oh, look, there's hanging bits. This is, this is, this is what I call Superman, this project, because it's like a man with three testicles. <laughs> <laughs> the one on the right is actually a four-story restaurant, and then the other two are bars, and on top of that is, um, is, is a club where I've been forced to sing karaoke, which I wouldn't bother come listen to me. Um, and there's an Italian, uh, Italian restaurant on top of that. But I wanted to keep this way open. It's all suspended because there's a very shallow tunnel that goes under this part of the site. It's all right, no. I don't know where to start, that's inside. Oh yeah, we're just, got, just doing planning. This is in Newport Street not far from here, just on the other side of the river. A residential, again, with a very, 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 very small gallery on the ground floor. <laughs> but Newport Street could be a great street. This is a street where, who's the dotty guy, artist, very well known? Oh, uh, Damien Hirst, yeah. He's just finishing off his museum, which is further down the street. That would be good. I, I quite like him. He's a funny guy. Mm -hmm. It's all concrete, though. And this is in Manchester. Just about to start phase one of this. But I won't tell you about this because then I can... This one, I'm looking for one thing in particular. That's the doodle bar and the test bed and blah, 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 blah. Because I like that. I like the idea of just fiddling around with existing buildings. It doesn't always have to be new. You can just do very little. And there is such a thing as over-designing. And most architects over-design. So on that building in, in Battersea, with the, the building over the building, I had to go to a design review panel. You know, there's the great and the good, you know, foster people and other people. And they're all saying, why don't you knock the existing building down? And then, you know, I know these guys. You see them, they come to the doodle bar afterwards and say, are we trying to help you, Will? You know, I said, I don't want to knock it down. That's the whole point. You know, there's a whole consequential city that comes out of not knocking things down, but adding things on, building over the top, going underneath. I mean, there's also, it would be an enriched city and could absorb a lot of things. And I don't want to knock things down because however ugly it is, it belongs possibly 
to someone's childhood. It's one of their memories. And you know, to, to erase those is very difficult. To change them is OK, but to keep them and change them is fine, I think. It's very <coughs> important. You don't have to have clearance. You know, there used to be a phrase very popular in the, in the, in the, in the 60s, slum clearance. Oh, pity. Too late. There's the other slums on top. There's our beach. That's Norman Foster behind us. When we're drinking on a nice summer day on the beach, I can see Norman Foster's guys at the glass windows going, Ah, oh, help me. <laughs> But, oh yeah, this is under construction now in China, in Chongqing. I don't know what's happening here. Thank you. Which is, I call test bed two. So I move, I've moved my studio, or I'm about to move my studio into this building in Chongqing. Uh, we're doing doodle two, doodle bar here, bigger. The, the um, gin distillery here be a performance space, a hotel. I mean, it's just what I call an evolving project. In other words, you make it up as you go along. You have a vague plan and then build it in. This is my work hotel. It's a combination between workspaces in the existing building and sleeping spaces in these pods which latch on, which is actually you discover is what's required by, there's a lot of young people there. That's the cocktail bar for the hotel. And this is what it's like. We're renovating the building. But if the tile's loose, knock it off. If it stays there, leave it. So it takes on a certain pattern. Quite nice. And oh, goodness gracious me. What go wrong here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no balustrade. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's all right. Anyway, we're doing that, and it's, I, I enjoy, I love this project. And this is just, that, this really is the last thing. It's called Las Eras in Spain, also my evolving project, uh, to which, I won't tell you the whole story, we haven't got time, but anyway, there's 350 hectares of space around here. This thing in front is a garden, which is now a vegetable garden, always was, historically. We've re-roofed the whole of the building so it doesn't leak anymore and, and it's insulated and you, you can't tell anyone's touched it, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and then taking out, because the oldest part of this building is a thousand years old, and then they went on and this horribly ugly, ugly tower was actually, I think, 1907. So quite late, really. And in the end, the family was reduced to one woman who lived there alone, still doing the garden at a great age, and she didn't want to sell until she was out in the garden and went back into the house and somebody had stolen her bed and she thought, it's time to move. <laughs> and um, so now my, my client, his good friend, it, we've actually done it up. We built, we've got the kitchen, which is the original kitchen, where you can cook. I'm talking about you lot now. Um, there's a slightly modern kitchen because we discovered that fridges are quite important, sadly. There is a dormitory to take up to 12 people like you, and a very comfortable for bedroom, a bedroom for people like you. <laughs> or you can sleep with them, it doesn't matter. There's a, a, a very large hot tub next to the cattle. So you mustn't be bashful though. There's some very nice toilets that actually break down and we can recycle. Uh, human waste back onto the vegetable garden. It's all done properly. And the idea is that students from around the world, from different architectural students, come, spend a few days there, explore the terrain, which is very beautiful anyway. You choose a spot, you come back, you design some, something where you could sleep or spend time, primarily using stuff that's on the site, but you, we can bring other stuff in. Then if we like it, you come back and with some greater expertise than you probably have, we'll build it. So over a period of time, we will have 50 or 60 places out in the terrain. I don't really want anyone to sleep in the house. You know, there'll be a music room with one piano, a library with one book, um, a place for films, 
And then we will gradually add, uh, uh, I think, a blacksmith shop, a carpentry shop, um, maybe a pottery, ceramicist, um, and cooking classes, if you want. So how do you actually do this, master, there needs a master plan without doing a master plan. How do you communicate to the local authority? And, you know, and the Spanish are very difficult. Any Spanish people here? No. <laughs> They're very bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. However, so I wrote a novel, a novel, novella, and a, and a book, which actually gives a possible future for this place without, because I didn't want to actually fix it, because that's not the point of it. So I'd like just to say that if any group of students would like to come here, book in, there is a small charge of 70 euros a night, but that includes pick up, I sound like a, <laughs> like a travel agent here, it pick up from Girona, which is the local airport or railway station, and includes all the food and all the wine, which, and the wine is made from an estate next door, so it's all quite good. So you don't have to worry about anything. And we can put on a bus for a night out in Girona, which is not an uninteresting city. Bob's your uncle. It's great, isn't it? You want to come, don't you? <laughs> Sign up today. <laughs> no, I'm sure that you will respond to this and find a good slot that fits into your program. Uh, we've had people from Mexico there. Um, that's good. Vienna, they were the guinea pigs. That's why I discovered that you don't send students in November. It really is too cold. Um, but they enjoyed it. So feel free to come. I don't, have I given you a book? Really? Yes. I did. Did you bring it in and share it with your students? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it. So let's, let's do that. I'll stop at that point because we've had quite enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go home now.